Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nigel Cunningham. I have the privilege of working for a firm called Technocrat. Absolutely love it. If you're looking for a job, talk to us uh, at the desk over there. <laughs> there are some websites that should maybe just not exist anymore. <laughs> maybe some of them uh, have uh, you know general problems that are. Uh, just make you want to cringe when you look at the design. Maybe the design was dated now, or it was just never a good idea. This one is still live. Um, I could do alt tab to uh, Chrome and show you it, but I'll leave you to, to, to discover it later. In other cases, um, perhaps there were poor decisions that were made when the website was being built. Um, last minute additions that maybe were a bit of a hurried build. Or maybe the implementation of a website was just constrained by what was available at the time when it was made. Sometimes a website doesn't do things that are wanted in the modern environment. Maybe it doesn't match, for example, what the competition are providing today. For the most part, the Master Builders Association in New South Wales that our company takes care of is none of these things, I'm very glad to say. But there is one section of the website that is an exception to that. The Master Builders Association is an association, as you probably guessed from the name, of builders. They exist to provide their, the builders in New South Wales with a bunch of services, representation before government, um, promoting excellence among builders, providing them with services. And uh, one of the services that they provide to their builders is support for in providing contracts to their customers. So if I'm a builder in the Master Builders Association in New South Wales, and I have a customer that I'm going to be doing a residential build for, or maybe a, a, a renovation of their house, Maybe I'm a larger builder and I'm going to be building a skyscraper. I can make use of my membership in the MBA to uh, get at access to contracts that can help me with taking care of that need to fulfil my contractual obligations with the client. When we were building the MBA website in, uh, that went live uh, early 2019, one of the areas that was added as a pretty last minute addition was the e-contract support. The e-contracts had existed before that. It had been done in a completely different system, not Drupal. And they, because it was done as a last minute hurried addition, it was done without a lot of thought to theming or such like. It was just ported as it is, as it was. And so he says, pushing the right button again, they ended up with something that looks like this. It looks like it belongs in 2010 still, doesn't it? Apart from the bit at the top, which is slightly cut off, which is just the normal page here. It's quite JavaScript heavy, and it's really, in a lot of ways, quite ugly. Behind the scenes, it uses two Twig templates, one for this display and another one for the PDF. It has to use the two PDF, two twig templates because we're using WK HTML to PDF to render the PDFs. And that is a, a binary that is pretty dated, doesn't always have support for the most recent job, um, CSS and so on that you might use in the browser itself when people are filling out these forms. It also means, of course, that if they want to make a change to one of these contracts, it requires a deployment. I, as a developer, have to go in and edit one Twig template to add whatever the field is, make whatever the changes, and then I have to go into another template, make edits to that, and because the version of WK HTML to PDF on your dev environment might not match the version on the server, I also have to do a bit of an iterative approach, making sure that it's going to look right when the PDF is generated on the server. There's no electronic signing with this, which of course every man and his dog wants nowadays. 
not even remotely possible to support it. So MBA came to us, I think it was towards the end of last year, with a shopping list for changes. They wanted the system rebuilt. And on their shopping list were things like, we want the administrators of our website, so MBA staff members, to be able to add new fields to the contracts, to edit them, and to be able to modify what the PDF content looks like. We'd like to be able to do calculations in there. So if a builder enters in, in some fields saying, here are the payments that need to be made, and here's the deposit that's going to be provided to start with, then we'd like to be able to calculate the total price automatically, but then also let you override that if you need to. We'd like it to make it more faithful to what the paper version of the contract looks like. And we'd like to support electronic sign. Truth be told, they've been having a look at the electronic contracts that are provided by MBA in Queensland, and they wanted what they'd seen there. But it wasn't just them looking at it. The builders were looking at what was possible too and saying, why are you providing us with this really old looking, horrible interface when we know we can get something that's so much better? There are other requirements they had as well. Things like uh, being able to take the, the front page of the contract and put the builder's own logo as an overlay on that, adding that to the front page of the contract. They wanted to be able to add additional files. So if the builder wants to upload the designs, maybe some images, they can include that in the PDF that's generated for the contract too. I had my own little shopping list. I wanted to drop the WK HTML to PDF support. I wanted to find a better way of creating the PDFs. In addition to that, I wanted to make the generation of the PDF much more debuggable, much more developer friendly, so that when we're adding new CSS or adding some new way of doing things, we don't have to do that iterative, painful process. I wanted to make sure that it was secure and scalable. I wanted to make sure that whatever we use as much as possible is open source. And I wanted to make sure that whatever we built was gonna work well on IronStar's service, our sister company's hosting that we use. It needed to work with the Docker containers that they use. So that of course limits in a good way some of the things that you can do. Initial ideas that I had. Well, if you want to be able to add fields and remove them and modify settings as an end user, web forms pretty much as you go to, isn't it? So of course it was the first thing I thought of for how are they going to be able to edit the forms. In addition to that, I thought maybe we could use Puppeteer to generate the PDFs. I learned pretty early on in my investigation of the possibilities that Google Chrome has an option where if you run it headlessly, so no web, no screen attached, you can control it through a web socket and in that mode, it can generate PDFs. Of course, that raises questions. How good is the quality of the PDFs that are generated? How, how good are outcome are we going to get? Is it going to support everything that we want? But it was a possibility to look at. Could we use CSS to generate the table of contents and the page numbering? I looked up specifications and did a bit of Googling and so on, and I found that there has been support in the um, W3 specifications, at least a draft spec, in browsers or for browsers to support CSS page numbering and all sorts of things like that since 2015. Sounds like it should be a goer, doesn't it? Let's find out. And then we had the requirement for DocuSign integration. So I thought, okay, probably a REST interface we'll make use of there. Left that to one of our other developers to figure out. So we had a general implementation plan 
something to work through and see what would work. The web form part of things came together pretty quickly and easily. Your normal sort of wizard progress bar that you see across the top of a web form when you've got multiple pages, all we've really done is some CSS on it to mod and uh, I think maybe a little bit of a change to the to the templates, but that's it still just down the side instead and providing tabs. Um, of course, with web forms, you get out of the box support for a wide range of fields, so we were pretty covered in what we needed. Um, also, composites were there. So I talked about multiple payments before. That was how we could set up being able to say there are going to be multiple values for this field and it's going to have a description and a number. We did some things with some custom modules, though. We've got seven e contracts that we want to implement. And we want to try and minimize the amount of hard coding of, of stuff throughout this so that the MBA administrators can have maximum flexibility. But we also want to ensure that the code that we do use works across all of these web forms consistently. We don't want to have something not work because in one form they added the workflow field with a underscore and in another one they put in two underscores. So what we did was create a module called nested web forms. What it lets you do is take one web form and embed it in all the others, which of course means you don't edit them in the other ones, you just edit them in the, the first one that's getting embedded. But it means that all of those fields you put in the one that gets nested, um, you can consistently get the same outcome in all the places it's nested. So we've used that for putting in our workflow state, for recording where the, the status of the contract is with DocuSign and with our payment process. Um, we've used it for recording where the DocuSign's being used, various other things that we want across all of the versions of the, the different contracts. We used a, a module called Webflow, Webform Workflows. I'm gonna say straight out, it's painful. It is designed mainly for a person who is a, a, a user to be, to be making modifications to the workflow. It's not designed for you to be programmatically changing the workflow. And so we've had difficulties with, there, with that area. We need to submit some patches to try and improve things there. We've also used the Webform Navigation module. It is what is letting us make those tabs so that you can just click on one to go to the page. It also makes it nice and convenient um, to do validation across the whole web form. So that if you're coming straight in from um, the dashboard, you can see what the required fields are that aren't filled in yet, um, even if you're not on that page yet. So a bunch of, of modules that we've used there. We also used a module called Config Entity Revisions that I spoke at, about a few years ago at um, the a couple of Drupal conferences below it, uh, ago, I think, um, so that we can do revisions of the web forms over time. It needs a bit of love itself, I say, as the maintainer, but hopefully we'll get there. The next question is, okay, you've got your field set up. How are you going to get them into a PDF? So what we did was we built a new, so a new interface in the a new tab in the web form configuration, and we created plugins. And so we've got four kinds, if I'm remembering correctly, at least three um, kinds of plugins that we've created. One is a plugin that just lets you upload a file, a PDF, and that's going to be included in the product in the generated PDF. Another one is a plugin that lets you fill out a WYSIWYG. So this is where you're going to put in the content that can be changed um, and that will come out from your web form. A third one is that the builders will be allowed to upload images and I talked about before in PDFs perhaps of their own. So we want to be able to embed them in the PDF that's generated. That plugin lets them do that. I think that is all, all of them. Yeah, looks like it is. Haven't forgotten anything. So then what does the individual plugins look like? 
Well, this is the WYSIWYG one, which I'll mainly show you because it's the most interesting. So you can see that it's pretty standard CK Editor plugin, but we've created a couple of additions there. There's a drop down up the top that lets you pick tokens from the web form. So the fields that you've created, you can select them from the drop down and insert a um, token substitution and where it should go in the web form. So if they've typed in the builder's address, that's, this lets you place the builder's address in the place it's going to appear in the PDF. That's the examples up here with the square brackets that maybe you can see or can't see. Um, it also lets us do um, inserting templates. So we used a template module that lets you insert a bunch of code or content quickly. Um, that we could use that for tables that were going to look consistent throughout the PDF um, that people would want to add for different purposes. Um, and then also styles. So we needed a way of saying, at this point here, start a new page. So this lets us put in a bit of text and say, um, select the style for it, and when the PDF gets generated, that's how it knows to create a new page. We've also got one for a table of contents entry. Um, and so because your entry in the table of contents might not match the heading that you actually want to display in the text at that point, we've made them separate things. So your table of contents can say foo, and your heading there can say bar, and it won't matter. But then there's the question of how we're going to do the actual PDF generation. We've got our content set up. How do we get to the PDF generation? Well, this is where that headless Chrome comes in. So you've got whatever your callers in Drupal that you want that you want to get a PDF from. What we're going using first is a module called Printable. This is another module that I've maintained for a little while since I worked for Salsa some years ago. It, it, I've extended that so that it adds new support through the PDF a, API module for a module called Puppeteer, I'm going to pronounce it as. It's a bit hard to pronounce, isn't it? Puppeteer with PHP in the middle of it. So my take is Puppeteer. You can come up with your own if you like. So that's a, that's a, a um, set of code that sits in the vendor directory. Puff Patir, or whatever you want to call it, talks to Node, starts a Node instance. And then Node talks to Puppeteer itself, which talks to Google Chrome. And Chrome, we feed the credentials and the URL we need so that it can then come back to Drupal and get the content to create the PDF. Bit of a convoluted looking procedure, isn't it? It's almost amazing that it works, but it does. Um, I tried this very early in the project. I wanted to establish that it worked before doing any of the other work because, of course, I didn't want to waste the effort on getting it going, if it, it, on doing everything else, if this wasn't going to work. It, um, it's not the only thing we're using, though. We also have a bunch of command line tools, most of which we already needed for the existing PDF generation. So it's things like QPDF and Poplar Utils um, as well. We also needed some libraries. So we're using the iMagic uh, library to do stuff like resizing the images, um, making sure they, they come out a sensible size in the PDF, and also to do that overlaying of the builder's logo on the, on the front cover that I talked about before. As far as PHP extensions went, the main addition that we needed to get all this going was the PHP sockets extension. Everything else we already had in from what we'd done with uh, WK HTML to PDF prior to this. What does the, the node support for it look like? Well, this is the uh, simply adding four requirements in a um, package.json in the top directory of the, the repo, so it's out of the dot root. 
pretty straightforward and simple. It was a lot less painful to set up and get going than I expected it might be. And that's all the code you're going to see, by the way, if I remember correctly. Um, I think I've already mentioned some of these things. So, yeah, the normal libraries for PDF generation that you would need, stuff like fonts and so on. Um, PHP sockets, iMagic, QPDF. Yep, I think I've mentioned all of those. So the process of actually generating the PDF. We've got our plugins that we've previously set up. One's got the PDF for the, the cover page. Then we've got our WYSIWYG. We've got some attachments that the builders provided. And we've got our appendices, which is just another PDF like the cover page to add on. I cre we created uh, first a a method in each plugin that lets um, us create some HTML content for, for Chrome. So for the cover page, we want to tell it how many pages it's going to have in that PDF that it's including. So the call is just generating some empty sections. Each one's going to take a whole page. Then with our WYSIWYG, we need to take the content and do things like replacing the content of the web form submission into your into your um, tokens that have been entered in the WYSIWYG. We also need to take our composites. So if you've got your builder's set list of payments that they're going to provide, in our editor, we've made it nice and easy for the administrators. So they don't have to enter five spaces, let's say, for there to be five possible payments. Because, of course, you don't know how many payments there are going to be for each one. So we have in our PHP code some, uh, some scripting that adds, looks at how many instances of the composite field there are in the submission and duplicates those lines to create the extra instances that are needed. So it makes it much easier for the, the end user to set up a, a contract. Um, we also need to somehow be able to tell DocuSign, this is the place in the contract where the person needs to be able to tick a checkbox, or this is the place where they need to be able to put in their signature, or this is a place where there are two options, one saying, yes, I've done something, or no, I haven't, and the person has to be able to tick one or the other, and it has to be required. So as part of our rendering, we need to put in tags for DocuSign to be able to do that. Adding headers and footers, of course, people like, like them, so we've got to have a way of doing that. All of that gets handled in this first step of rendering the submission. And then there's pagination. I mentioned the possibility before of using CSS to, to do the pagination. Turned out that wasn't a possibility. Even though the spec has been there since 2015, I don't think any browser implements it like it's written. Very little of it is implemented at all in any of them. And since, of course, we're using Chrome, um, we're really only interested in what Chrome is doing anyway, and unfortunately, it's not supporting it. So I had to find another solution. My solution ended up being using a live JavaScript library called page.js, page.js. It had some issues, and one of them was an important lesson I learned, that when you were telling page.js to do the pagination, you must supply it with the style sheets. It's not enough to just have them added into the HTML it's pulling anyway. And one of the parameters to say when you say do the pagination is style sheets, and you have to give it that icon. It um, gave me a good few hours at least, I forget how long now, of grief trying to figure out why were my pages not coming out the way I expected before I learned that that was the problem. Um, one of the, th the other things that we have in here is um, the making it easier for a developer to debug things. So because Chrome is having to access this all through a, through a browser, of course, um, to a, a URL, 
that means the developer could potentially go to the same URL, doesn't it, and, and visit the page, which is fine for debugging. But you don't want your end user to be able to go to that page and get the content of the PDF without have, buying the uh, support that you're preparing commercially to either, do you? So the way around that was to implement CSRF tokens. So set up, give when we're creating the PDF, we give Chrome a token that it can use to access the content. And then as a developer, I can turn off the use of those tokens so that I can do my debugging, check out the CSS, figure out why something's not appearing how it is, but still have it nice and secure when it goes to production. Um, table of contents generation was done via the page.js library as well, using some CSS, but it's CSS that page.js goes and looks at and figures out how to generate the table of contents properly. Couldn't just do that automatically because of the same reasons that the pagination wouldn't put it. For the other pages, again, we just need to know how many blank pages. So this then gives, it, gives Chrome one great big long piece of HTML that it can generate the, the uh, initial version of the PDF from, but it doesn't yet have in it each of the, the pages that are on the left and the two sections on the right. So then we need to do some post-processing after it has created the initial version. And so then we're just using PDF Unite, um, tools like that, command line tools, to take our initial PDF and substitute in the bits. For putting the logo in, we're using iMagic, as I mentioned previously, to first overlay that the builder's logo onto the PDF, uh, a copy of it, of course, so we don't go sticking them all on one after another as we build different contracts. And then we insert that into the content on top of that. The WYSIWYG needs no further processing, that content. Um, and so that's the way that we're building the PDF. The DocuSign integration. I'm only going to mention this briefly because the focus, of course, is mainly the PDF building. I mentioned the token replacement earlier. Um, that's the way that we position the fields and say what the fields are. Um, we're using a REST API, as I initially expected, to talk to DocuSign. That has, DocuSign can make callbacks and in turn back to us to update the state of the, the signing. So that means that we don't then require that each builder has their own account with DocuSign. They can see the status of the project, perform whatever actions they need to entirely in Drupal. Um, it also gives us the possibility of uh, doing a integration with, docu with Drupal Commerce, um, the, the way we've done things. So we were able to get them to pay uh, a different amount if they're using DocuSign or not. And if they cancel the signing partway through and come back and they need to buy a new envelope from DocuSign, we can take care of that as well. So what does it end up looking like? We, our generated PDF looks very much like the original paper copy that MBA sell. This is what it looks like in DocuSign. So you can see the person is partway through signing. They've got a little prompt there. Here is the place where you need to sign. They click. They can do a signing using a tablet or use the provided uh, default that DocuSign provide. The content looks just like it would be on a paper copy. So MBA were very happy with the way that turned out. They can also have uh, sections that can have check boxes. So here you can see the person is required to tick each of those check boxes down the side to say, yes, these things have been provided. And then at the bottom here, they need to pick one or the other of these and sign them um, to say that they, that they have, in this case, uh, what is it? received a complete copy of all the documents that relate to it. So that's the end of uh, my talk. Do people have any questions? Yes. My voice is probably loud, but thank you.
Um, are the PDFs generated accessible? Do they meet WCAG accessibility standards? Um, I have not tested that. I'm not sure. Probably not, therefore. But we we could probably do work to make them accessible because we've got complete control over the HTML that's used. Okay, I work um, I'm with the government and um, obviously any PDF generated by us have to be accessible. It's yeah. government standard and now obviously WCAG standard as well. So that would be a useful thing for us. Yeah. Yeah, it's not something we have had to focus on yet, but I'm sure it will be doable given how much else has been achieved. Any other You, um, do you have to spin up that node service every time you use it or background? Um, I have created a patch so that it can just stay running in the background. At the moment, we, we're not using that and we're just letting it spin up each time. We'll see how much it, it gets used and whether it becomes an issue. But it, it's relatively quick to do the PDF generation. The old system takes a few seconds. This probably is about the same, so PDF generation is not fast anyway, and we've got a lot of processing to do in that, so, yeah. Um, hey, thanks for Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you just come here to brag about how you did it, or you can <laughs> open, <laughs> open, share openly that whole process of how you do things with the community? We, we, no, we're not, not just here to brag about it. I, I, as you know, I. I like to contribute as much as I can back to Drupal, and uh, I'm working with MBA so that we'll contribute as many of these uh, mod custom modules we've made as we can. Yeah, I must be because it sounds like a very complex um, thing. It will take like a knowledge base article or something to explain how everything was done. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, certainly want to contribute them. And some of the modules have been explicitly designed so that they're standalone and contributable. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Could you talk a little bit more about the integration with the DocuSign and how you were able to position those DocuSign specific fields? Yeah, it, it is a, an interesting problem because I found that, you, that, that their suggestion is that you put little tags in with unique pieces of text. And then when you are sending the API, you tell them what the unique pieces of text are to look for. The, the difficulty is laying things out so that those little pieces of text don't distort the, the appearance of the rest of the PDF. So I think in the end, um, it's been a while since I did it, so I don't, won't guarantee that I remember this correctly. I think I chose to use a very small font size, like 0.1 of a pixel or something, um, and then also either making it transparent or yeah, and no, I think it was transparent as well. The the font size being important so that the size of the text doesn't go pushing other things out. I tried absolute positioning, that sort of thing, um, and was not successful in using them to, to achieve. Mike. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, you mentioned that you, you went through the process of doing a bit of a proof of concept to make sure everything would work the way that you hoped it would before you did the build. Yeah. Having now gone through and done the build and having this live in production, what would you do differently? What 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 do you wish you had approached differently? And the second question really quickly is, how many hours did this take you? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me first say it's not in production yet. We had planned that it would be by the time I did this talk but uh, things have delayed it, and so it will be in production in a couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, yeah, maybe next weekend, I've forgotten the details. Uh, things that I wish we'd done differently? I think I can honestly say I don't wish that we'd done anything differently. I'm happy with, very happy with the outcome. Yeah, you don't often say that. <laughs> um, how many hours? Most of the work, as you probably gathered, has been has been my time on the project. But I've had at points I've had at some points I've had two developers working with me. Sometimes only one. It's 
I wouldn't want, wouldn't know how many hours I'd be calculating, but I think I've been working on this pretty much since January, maybe, maybe December. Um, so so it has been a lot of work. But it's worth it. They're, they're, they're really happy with the outcome. And, and I'm really happy with the outcome. So are, yeah. they, are they now the envy of other master builder associations? Well, it's States? not in production yet, so uh -huh. we'll see. The the Queensland one does look really good. I've only seen screenshots of it. But the cre quint one important difference is the Queensland one uses a credit system to pay for your to your um contracts or your DocuSign part of things, whereas here we're sending them to um, Drupal Commerce. And so they can make a whole bunch of contracts and then put them all into a card at once and pay for them once together, but it's not a credit system. Um, so maybe that will make the difference between it being the MV or not. Well, we'll see. I don't know how the Queensland one is built. Thank you all for your time.